Thank you for staying with us. Uh, the federal government explains why the war against insurgency has not been won. Um, of course, uh, still is plot, uh, plus politics. Uh, so much more that we still will be discussing. Uh, we'll be right back. The Southeast Support Group, SESG, has expressed worry over Nigeria's political and zoning system, which favors one zone over another. The convener of the group, Ojuku Imano, spoke to newsmen in Abuja, saying this has affected the Southeast region, so changing them politically over the years. He called on Southeasterners in Nigeria to bury their grudges against the current administration and throw their weight behind President Mohamed Buhari to help the Southeast achieve its political dream. Nigeria's political system and its reward mechanism subscribe on written to the patronage of regions or zones of people who have actively supported a leader during the electoral process or at the point of enthronement of a leader we have lived with this culture for ages. Unfortunately, Indibo has fared on both scores. The examples of our voting patterns in 2015 presidential election and even in 2019 presidential ballots bears ample testimony to the rejection of President Muhammad Buhari, GCFR, and all APC or Progressive Congress because of certain grudges we lost. We neither supported President Buhari nor the APC at the time of lying the golden eggs. But the rest of Nigerians did, and they won. And therefore, by these partisans, miscalculation and misplacement of our political priorities, Indibo became sus suspicable to the neglect or patronage or development, largeness of the present develop developed government based on our particular leadership culture. We dare say President Buhari is passionately pro Indibo, and those still throwing darts at him are doing it to our detriment as a legion and people. Welcome back. The federal government has appealed to the world powers not to allow arguments to stop them from providing the country with weapons to fight insecurity. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, asked Nigerians to assess the efforts of the federal government in the fight against insecurity by comparing the state of the country between 2015 and today. And in a bid to suggest ways to fight insecurity in the country, the Benue state governor, Samuel Otom, has urged the federal government to grant licenses to responsible citizens to carry sophisticated weapons such as the AK-47. Joining us to discuss this is Kabir Adamu, a security expert and retired Air Vice Marshal Femi Badibu. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Good evening. Good evening Thank to you, you too. Um, I'll start with uh, Mr. Femi. This is obviously not a new debate, but again, is it um, time to consider uh, the call? Well, the issue of small arms or light arms is not, is not new. It has always been there. I'd like to um, inform you that apart from being a retired military officer, I was actually... Uh, raised in the police barracks. So even right from when I was young, I was aware that uh, uh, people had personal arms. And the only requirement is that it must be registered by uh, the Commissioner of Police on behalf of the federal government. And once you have it registered, um, you are also expected to use it responsibly. Now, light arms definitely would not include AK-47. Um, AK-47s are very serious weapons. And even in the United States where people can, all can have all kinds of arms, there are certain categories of individuals who can have what you call most sophisticated fighting arms. And um, the, the call on individuals like that is to use it in self-defense and to use it to maim the intruder, offender, or whatever. So you would not be shooting at the head or the chest. You would be shooting at the legs, or if the person has in their hand, maybe you shoot at the hand to disable the individual from getting to you. So it means, of course, that you, it's not just about signing or registering that you want to buy a weapon or you bought a weapon. 
but you must also undergo certain training to make sure you use it well. I must also tell you that from history in Nigeria, if you ask most mature people, they will tell you that they are aware of individuals, including military officers, who have uh, carelessly left their um, personal weapons. It could be in a drawer or something, and um, a child has stumbled on it, a curious child has stumbled on it, and has used it carelessly against either a sibling or another neighbor's child, and actually have accidentally killed a child. So people like that will also tell you that um, having a weapon at home is not something to joke with. Uh, it's something to really think about. And um, in these days that we're beginning to see cases of one-on-one -on -one, uh, violence in the home where uh, the spouse is taking on the other one, uh, stabbing with a knife or certain things like that. You can imagine what would happen if uh, such a weapon was in the house and one was trying to use it to threaten the other and accidentally go off. So, yes, I know that we have problems and I know that there's need for calls, but I know, uh, but I, I must say that there's need for caution in the way that uh, our responsible citizens make these calls. Okay, and, and also judging, because you also just spoke about that now, judging from the proliferation of light weapons and ammunition, um, the licensing and possession of guns um, across uh, the country, the laws that we currently have, would you then suggest that some of those laws are um, fixed or you know, adjusted so that we can accommodate more people? Because some of the, the examples that you gave um, may not necessarily be in areas that are dealing mostly with, you know, the insurgency as it seems, um, the banditry as it seems. It's, it's, it's in villages. Do you think that we may need to adjust some of our laws with regards to proliferation of uh, light weapons and ammunition so that those people in those areas uh, may also be able to have these weapons? Well, it you see, um, there's what the military call close quarter fighting. Um, if you check, you will find that officers, as a rule, do not carry rifles. They carry pistols. It is the men who carry rifles. And a rifle, like, uh, the reason is that when you are close to someone, um, you, you know, you can use a pistol and achieve uh, reasonable accuracy. But when you are at a distance of 100 meters or or more, you need a long range weapon, which is where the, the rifle comes in. And you know, the more powerful the rifle, the more distance the, the bullet can travel and with more accuracy. Now, if you have the, the kind of insurgency we're having, people are in their villages and then insurgents come in, uh, a rifle is not necessarily gonna help you. I mean, I'll tell you here that I find it very funny when you see civilians, you know, moving around with a policeman in their car carrying a rifle, and you're thinking that that can protect you in, an, in a situation where you're ambushed, it really doesn't. It, what, what would help was be more of a pistol and so on. But the important thing here is that whoever gets a license must also be required to undergo some form of training. Yeah. And it's not about a one-month training. It's just a day or two. One is to secure the rifle, to make sure it is secure. Another one is to uh, use it effectively. Uh, the rifle has, uh, you can keep it totally un 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 unloaded in times of peace. Let's say you are in, a, in an area like that during the day. And when you're about to go to bed at night, you load it and you put it on safety. And it is only when you feel the need to use it. You can imagine what will happen in a village when some people move around at night for one reason or the other, and uh, a panicky individual just starts firing at random, what will you end up is that somebody in another house or somewhere, and, will, and you'll just end up, you know, in chaos. There must be, I mean, weapons are not things you toy with. Yeah. I, I mean, That's aside, the, aside the fact not that. Things you toy with. Yes, we need to defend ourselves. Yeah. But we must also consider how do we make sure that they are in safe hands. Yeah, I mean, that, that's also something I believe that we would have to, you know, deal with, you know, through legislation and all that, you know. But do you believe that in any way it would make a difference 
in saving lives um, across the country. If you, if you put into perspective, you know, the people of Salvan Kaduna and the people of Benue State and all some of those crisis areas that have been really affected by bandits, um, would you say that, and I'm going to move, move to Mr. Kabir now um, to answer this one. Do you, would you say that these weapons in the hands of villagers, hands of people living in those rural areas might make a difference in the fight against insurgency and, and insecurity? Um, my candid opinion is, is no. Um, a lot of the discussions I'm hearing at the moment is driven by hate. Um, there is mutual suspicion. Uh, a situation of um, you know two groups divided along sometimes ethnic and religious um, lines, um, mutually suspicious of one another, and um, frankly looking to exact some form of vengeance yeah. on the other side. So imagine in such a situation, you now arm them with semi-automatic weapons or even automatic weapons, um, which is what the AK-47 is. Um, one magazine, um, if I'm right, uh, it's about 30 um, you know, bullets in it. And most times what they do is they tie the two magazines, making 60. So you, basically what, what we are saying is that you are arming an individual with the capacity to kill 60 people. And what if, for instance, you 10 or more of such weapons are in a single community? That means we are taking ourselves back to the Hobbesian um, state of nature, where uh, people, the strongest, would, would, would survive as it were. So I've, I, in all honesty, not in support of um, this call. Um, I mean, allowing such a community, even if they are rural communities, to own weapons, especially combat weapons um, would not, in the current circumstance of mutual hatred, mutual anger, would not in any way be productive and useful for circumstance. I, I will take us back a little bit. I, I want to know your thoughts on where these ideas are even coming from. Um, would you say, because I know that there are countries who have gun laws, um, and of course, um, it makes it okay for people to carry, you know, um, sometimes maybe pistols, sometimes automatic weapons. Um, but the fact that we're having this conversation in the first place, does this in any way tell you that the government is almost feeling like they cannot protect Nigerians entirely? Um, yeah, there are two reasons why this is coming up. Firstly, is the trust deficit between the generality of um, citizens and the security agencies. The other reason is our constitution which um, rests security clearly on the exclusive list. Now, a governor like Governor Otum, let's remember that two, three years ago, his state was at the center um, spot, the hotspot for the kind of killings that we're seeing in Nigeria at the moment. And um, so much happened in, in the state. Uh, we're all living witnesses. He left the ruling party and moved to the, to the opposi opposition party. Um, not only that, uh, there was a time when Mr. President asked the Inspector General of Police to move down to Benue, and it became obvious after he visited that he didn't go. So clearly that trust deficit is, is a fact. Then um, you now have a governor who, in spite of him being the, you know, um, C, the, the, the highest uh, political ranking officer in the state, and by nomenclature, he's supposed to be heading the security, uh, state security council. But then, unfortunately, because the Constitution rests um, security or authority in the hands of the federal government, the presidency, it doesn't have much influence in terms of directing the various security departments that are within the state. So he's expressing his frustration, which is, which is understandable. Um, fine, you don't want your people to be killed, and nobody wants someone he loves to be killed. But then would, would the solution to that be arming more people? Um, I want to specifically talk about a militia um, leader in Benue State uh, by the name of, um, I, I can't remember the exact name, but there is a particular outlawed gang leader in yeah. Benue State that, um, as far as I know, has recruited and is training to, to a, larger, a, a larger extent a militia group. Now, the point being made by the governor is that the current security architecture has been unable to take care of um, that the, 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 secu the insecurity challenges in the country. The name of the militia leader is Ghana. He's been declared an outlaw 
And as far as we know, he's still operating between the border community of Benue and, and, and um, Taraba State. And we all know that a lot of killings and kidnapping are ongoing there. So clearly, there is a failure of the existing security architecture to tackle um, the security challenges in the country. And what the governor is doing is recommending ways to yeah. address the security challenges. And um, even though the focus of our discussion is not on the other aspects of his recommendation, but he also made some other recommendations ap ap apart from you know, the we weaponization. And I think myself and my co-discussant are agreeable that we further weaponization of Nigeria is not the way to go. Um, even if we're going to do it, there should be um, strict guidelines and measures. And because unfortunately we're a country that uh, finds it very difficult to follow guidelines and implement those guidelines judiciously, then I think this um, advice, unfortunately, is not the way to go. The other um, components of his statement, including solving the economic challenges, um, you know, restructuring the uh, drug and law enforcement agency, and several others, they are all commendable, you know, um, statements and, and, and advice. But this particular one, I think it would lead us back to the Hobbesian right. state of nature, where the strongest okay. person. All right. Would. I want to. I want to then go to um, go back to Mr. Femi Badebo. Um, I, I also want to look at a statement from the Minister of Information that the uh, international community is stopping Nigeria from purchasing weapons to fight the insurgency because of unsubstantiated <laughs> claims. Um, would you say this is in any way similar to what had happened in the previous administration when the U.S. had placed an arms ban on Nigeria? Um, well, if you... And I think a day or two ago, Mr. President did announce that some fighter jets that they procured will be arriving early next year. Um, when you're talking about arms, it depends on what you, the, the category of arms you're looking at. Um, for fighting the insurgents, there are certain things would need. And so they can always come up with issues like this. I've always mentioned on fora like, th like this one that um, international community have the capacity through the use of satellites and so on to monitor and tell you what is going on, particularly in Sambista Forest and in the northeastern area, as far as movement of aircrafts like helicopters that are coming to rearm uh, the insurgents and stuff like that. You don't move such heavy equipment uh, on horseback, for instance, or, or on motorcycles. But for reasons best known to them, uh, they have consistently kept this information to themselves. I can, uh, I can tell you that for as far back as maybe 2008, you know, the, the satellites could, can pick vehicles packed in your compound there at Plus TV. They know your MD's car. They can tell if it's there or if it's gone out. So using that same technology, they can, you know, monitor movements in these areas, we don't have that technology and they will not give it to us readily, but to assist in the fight, they can. Uh, so I think what is more at play is whether they are in support of a particular administration or not. Uh, if we want to go back to maybe the year 2000, there was an analysis made by the United States uh, intelligence services that said Nigeria was going to be um, a failed nation by 2015. And everything has been working towards that. And I'm sure those who are making those analyses are baffled at the fact that we continue to struggle on. And I think it is a question of uh, our, our, our leaders, presidencies on one side, but you see, we get discordant notes from our governors. One governor on this side is saying one thing, another one is getting, and then they're getting, sometimes they speak it from, a point of emotion. And when you speak from emotion, you don't get the facts right. Yeah. So like what I'm saying, for instance, is that the presidency has to find a way to get all our governors together, to get the police, to brief them on certain things like this uh, use of small arms, to get the military to brief them on certain things about their operations and what's going on. It is wrong for a state governor to suddenly go to radio or TV and be talking about operations. You don't understand military operations. And I believe that the insurgents are taking advantage of this, this harmony and this discord between us. Yeah. 
So it's not about bringing the latest fighter jets into Nigeria or bringing a nuclear weapon into Nigeria. The kind of arms and ammunition that we have already, if properly utilized, if intelligence is properly brought together so that people are not going into the bush to go and do you try your luck. Yeah, all right. It will be a situation where you secure a village, you hold that village, and from time to time you move out. But you can see what's happening. Um, as a retired military officer, honestly, sometimes I'm upset by the kind of information you keep you hear coming from uh, our various governors. All right, I, I want to, you know, quickly. Um, we're going to wrap up with um, Kabir. I, I want you to quickly, in one minute maximum, quickly just share with us your thoughts on um, if it is more weapons we need from the international community or better intelligence gathering. Um, unfortunately, we, we need both, as it were. We do not have um, a local weapon manufacturing industry. The best we have is Daikon, and Daikon is not producing anything that you can take to Sambisa Forest or even that you can take to Zamfara. So we need that. Um, as far as intelligence is concerned, nothing beats your own intelligence. Um, I can tell you clearly that we do have intelligence liaison arrangements with almost all the big countries of the world. But is it helping us? No. My co-discussant mentioned that um, satellites are focused on Nigeria, yet there is movement of weapons all around, but nothing happens. Um, for the simple reason that they will not interfere in local, um, you know, internal uh, uh, politics and affairs of, of um, a, a, a sovereign country. Um, but do we do have liaison, intelligence liaison agreements with them. Now, what is more important for me is citizen awareness. We need to call up our government at all the levels, um, at the federal level, at the state level, and then, of course, at the local level. It is only then that we will see more responsiveness and accountability by all the levels all right. of government. But weaponization is not the way to go. There are 27 ministries, departments, and agencies that are involved in security in Nigeria. And every year, we give them money. What kind of metrics are we using to measure their performance? Frankly, nothing. So we, that's the area to look at. Let's make sure when we give them money, they actually meet the, our requirements and our needs. And our requirements are simple, protect life and property. Thank you so much uh, to uh, Kabir Adamu and, of course, uh, Mr. Fahmik Badebo for um, you know, the conversation we've had. Um, and, of course, I hope that we can continue to um, talk about these things. Um, and also thanks to um, uh, viewers for joining us. We'll take a short break now. When we come back, I'll be giving my take. This is my take. The Gun Control Act of 1968, which regulates firearms in the United States, requires that citizens and legal residents must be at least 18 years of age to purchase shotguns or rifles or ammunition. All other firearms, handguns, for example, can only be sold to persons aged 21 and older. Over the years, there have been repeated calls for more legislation on U.S. gun control rules after repeated abuse of that freedom and mass shootings which have claimed dozens of lives, sometimes racially motivated. This is a country where the government takes full responsibility in maintaining a security architecture to check the abuse of gun ownership and protect innocent lives. The case in Nigeria, however, is very different. Wave after wave of attacks by insurgents such as the Boko Haram sect, bandits, ISWAP, kidnappers and more come and go. But the Nigerian government still has not been able to provide a lasting solution to these injustices. Citizens are still very burdened with having to deal with a lack of basic amenities such as power, clean water, health care, infrastructure, good education. The call for citizens to arm themselves, in my opinion, is once again leaving the responsibility of the government in the hands of the citizens. And that's all for today. Plus Politics returns tomorrow at 7 p.m. with even more interesting conversations. Remember to stay safe. Have a good evening.